Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you're connecting from. I'm Kumiki Tamori, and I'm here to welcome you back to the fifth session of uh, the OECD's Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum. This year, the theme is uh, Green Recovery, Rethinking the Built Environment and Transport. And um, I'm here to just make a, a couple of uh, logistical announcements. Um, I would like to remind everybody that this is a bilingual event and you see a, a little button at the bottom of your screen where the interpretation between English and French are available. So for those of you who need it, please make use of that. And also um, uh, there will be a, uh, um, sorry, there are lots of noises here. There will be a participant survey that you will receive or maybe you may have already. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to the, uh, the quality of the discussion and, uh, and the speakers and the relevant of the material provided for our conference. So we would love to hear from you. So please do take part in the, um, the uh, participant survey for both speakers and audience. And uh, without further ado, um, I would like to pass the floor to our esteemed moderator today. We have uh, Ben Simmons. He is the head of Green Growth and Knowledge partnership, he will introduce the, the theme um, of the session and the speakers and the fact that uh, how we might be all be able to make use of the Q&A function on the, on the conference. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kumi. And a, a very warm welcome to participants joining us from various parts of the world today. It is a great pleasure and honor to be moderating today's session on tracking and analyzing green recovery measures. As Kumi noted, this is the final session of this year's OECD Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum, and we are quite fortunate to have such a distinguished group of experts joining us today. I'm actually going to move right into introducing our panelists to ensure we have enough time for an active discussion and debate, and to ensure we have a time, uh, enough time to discuss questions raised by all of you. So if I may, I would like to begin by introducing uh, Julia Renault. Uh, Julia is the Senior Director at Breakthrough Energy. Uh, delighted to have you with us today, Julia. Uh, next, we have uh, Francesco Vona. Uh, is a Senior Economist at the OFCE Sciences Po and an Adjunct Visiting Professor at the University Cha Foscati of Venice. Francesco, thanks for joining. I am also happy to welcome Gabriel Wagner. He's an advisor with the German Agency for International Cooperation, GIZ. Uh, Gabrielle, a warm welcome to you. Next is my pleasure to introduce Oliver Greenfield. Oliver is the convener at the Green Economy Coalition. Always, Oliver, it's always a pleasure to see you. And um, of course, last but not certainly not least, we are joined by Enrico Botta. He's the Green Growth Coordinator at the OECD. Enrico, uh, great to have you in today's session. And of course, thanks again to the OECD for hosting this forum. As you can see, we have an incredible panel in front of us today. And as Kumi highlighted, in addition to the panel, we are of course very interested in hearing your thoughts and comments and would encourage you to use the Q&A panel. Um, and colleagues uh, at the OECD and with partners will be reviewing those questions and then submitting them to the panel. As today's discussion unfolds, I'll then be returning to those questions and do my best to integrate these into the exchange. Um, as you all know, this year's forum, and as Kumi mentioned, this year's forum is focused on COVID-19 recovery measures and their implications for greening both the built environment and the transport sector. And over the last few days in the course of the forum, we've heard from political leaders and experts on urban transport and design, sustainable tourism, energy efficiency in the building sector, and greening the transport sector. The aim of this final session is to bring all of this together and take a critical look at the discussions on green recovery and whether they're supported by the data when it comes to actual government investments and expenditures. And there are three big policy questions that the panelists will be addressing today. The first explores the recovery packages and whether they can deliver a just green transition. The second question is focused on how we can ensure that recovery measures support and expedite the research and development of green technologies needed to meet climate objectives. And the third policy question is focused on the key lessons from previous economic recovery efforts and how we can apply these to the COVID-19 recovery. Finally, at the end, uh, if we have time, I'm going to ask the panelists to bring the discussion together and suggest areas where further research and analysis is required. 
After the panel discussion concludes, I will be handing the session back to the OECD and Rodolfo, Rodolfo Lassi, uh, Director of the Environment Directorate for the closing of the forum. So um, to get us started, Enrico, I was hoping uh, I might be able to start with you and you would be willing to kick off the discussion for us and provide some background and context. Uh, the OECD has been closely tracking COVID-19 recovery programs in both OECD and non-OECD countries. Given this, I was hoping you could provide a sense of the level of commitment to a green recovery you are seeing and any other insights the data is providing. So Enrico, over to you. Yes. So thanks, thanks Ben, for moderating the session. And uh, the, uh, what we see at the OECD is basically the, when you look at the response of government to the pandemic, uh, this can be categorized into two large types. Initially, OECD governments focus on rescue measures, which mainly focus on containing the virus and limiting damages to the economy. More recently, uh, measures are focusing on promoting the recovery from the pandemic whose aim is mainly rebuilding the economies and often building them back better. The OECD Green Recovery Database focuses on the latter type of measures, recovery measures. So more precisely, the database tracks recovery measures have a clear positive, negative, or mixed environmental impact across different environmental dimensions in OECD countries and key partner countries. Now, of course, there are uh, several challenges when you try to evaluate how green a recovery is. Uh, first and above all, what do we mean by green and sustainable? Uh, how do we compare different policy types, for instance, regulation and tax breaks, but also what is exactly a COVID-19 recovery policy? Now, what is remarkable is that there are several uh, track initiatives out there, and they may not have all exactly the same definition, they all have difference in their geographical scope and the environmental dimension covered. But what is very important is that the results are remarkably consistent across the different tra trackers. Now, if we look at the latest update of the OECD database, I will say there are four uh, key messages that come out. First, uh, green measures have increased their importance in terms of number and budget. Since 2021, which is when the first uh, update or the first release of the database was made public, uh, we can see that environmentally positive measures, the budget allocated to these measures, has increased from around 330 US dollar billion to around 680 billions. And this represents almost a double of the spending allocated to measures with negative and mixed environmental impacts. Second, uh, this we see this increase in green spending, which is good news, but actually green spending overall accounts for a small share of total recovery spending. Overall, around 70% of the recovery budget does not have a direct impact on the environment or reverses progress on some environmental challenges. Thus, we are quite far away from the systemic transformation we would like to see. Third, uh, a few years of fossil fuel subsidies will be sufficient to balance out all green recovery spending. And fourth, and finally, uh, four key insight we see from, from, the, from the update is that we see a very uh, limited focus on innovation and skills development. Investment in R&D represents around 8% of recorded measures, while measures that target skills training represent only around 2% of the, of the total entries in the database. And so this limited focus on these two dimensions um, I would say further underlines that we are not only far away from a systemic change, because innovation is a key element if we want to uh, uh, have a systemic change in our economy and societies, but also we are quite far away from uh, ensuring a, green, a fair and just green transition to all. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Enrico. It was very interesting. I was wondering if you could just repeat um, what you said. I didn't quite catch it, but it sounded very interesting. <laughs> the point about uh, fossil fuel subsidies, um, I didn't quite catch the um, the numbers that you mentioned, but it sounded sure. very So uh, basically, uh, the amount of green spending amounts to around 680 billion. And this amount is going to be spent over a number of years, uh, while fossil fuel subsidies uh, the amount that is given out every year globally basically will balance out all green spending in a few years. So if you look at the number from last year, from 2020, uh, fossil fuel sources amounted to around 350. So just two years 
of fossil fuel subsidies are more than enough to balance uh, all green spending we have, we have, we have been able to track uh, across the globe. Interesting. Okay. And I guess that's, that's obviously clearly important given the discussions that took place last week in Glasgow as well. And, and some of the um, and some of the agreements uh, with respect to fossil fuel subsidies. So thanks, um, thanks very much, Enrico. Really interesting to hear the hear more about the OECD data um, that you've been collecting and some of and, and some of the trends you're seeing. So it sounds like there's some there's some positive trends, but ultimately it's it's still uh, what we're seeing is green spending is still a fraction of the overall um, overall recovery packages. Um, next, uh, Oliver, if I may. I wanted to turn to you because I know with the Green Economy Coalition, you have been actively tracking countries and their efforts to transition to a green economy through both green recovery programs and other policies. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about this analysis and what trends and insights you're seeing. Okay, hello. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for that question. Ben, I put in the chats for everybody the Green Economy Tracker. Look, the Green Economy Coalition tracks the Green Economy um, agenda more broadly, 20 top policy, but in COVID, we added another one, COVID policy, to look at whether the governments are taking this moment. Um, interestingly, first of all, those countries that are already on the green economy transition are better equipped to seek the moment and see the opportunity of COVID to start to restructure their economy. So that's a general theme. So they're already on this track, already more likely to be sensitized to the opportunities. Um, yeah. 30 plus countries in there, two thirds have no or minimal green recovery policies in place. So yeah, um, largely we're seeing a little bit of a north-south divide. Those countries with a, a fiscal space, Europe, North America, um, doing more. Um, those countries in the global south not doing as much. Now there's an assumption that they may not be interested in that, we, we question that, there is also the challenge of whether or not those countries in the global south have enough fiscal space to make some of the investments and transitions. Um, the question of their cash flow, um, the cash flow significant spend in Europe and, and the US um, not available to others. So the IMF in estimate Germany, US spent 30, 40% of their GDP trillions of dollars on stimulus and recovery. Nigeria, Indonesia, only 1.5%. So, you know, you're getting that a scale of significant difference. Um, we also see one of the other trends we see is that nature largely is being missed out as a recovery spend. Uh, I, you know, some of the world's most biodiverse global hotspots, Peru, Indonesia, Botswana, Malaysia, Brazil, have little or no mention of nature in their recovery agenda. So again, not necessarily picking up the idea of, of, of nature as, as part of the resilient um, societies and economies. Um, I guess, yeah, probably moving to some of the other questions, Ben, so you, you tell me when to shut up, but um, we, we don't want to repeat the mistakes of 2008, the financial crisis, um, where the green stimulus was used to kickstart things, but fundamentally, um, some of our analysis in 2008-9 showed that you know if you put, put green growth on top of a brown economy, you're not reducing CO2 emissions, you're just building green on top of brown. So more structural transitions need to be in place, specifically around energy and, um, and infrastructure. Um, and some of those structural policies, we've, we've produced a paper for this, um, for this event with the Partners for Inclusive Green Economy. Uh, which includes OECD and others. Um, it's a draft paper at the moment, but I, I draw your attention to that um, paper on structural green economy, green, green recovery reforms, uh, and largely the, the sense of the opportunity presented by things like green fiscal reform, CO2 pricing, fossil fuel subsidies would be relevant to both the stimulate the energy transition. So it's not just about um, it's not just about spend. It, it, it's also about structural policy reforms that creates the the conducive environment to help stimulate not only the recovery but also the transition that people that more and more governments have signed up to and you mentioned um, Glasgow last week so um, yeah we have identified some of those top 10 uh, green structural reforms in that paper I draw your attention to it and uh, I'll probably come back on other points uh, later on then thank you great thanks thanks so much Oliver and um um, I think it's really interesting and important point you mentioned on the structural reform and, and thanks for drawing people's attention to the background paper as well. 
Um, there is a, a question, and I just wanted to mention this to you, Enrico, in the Q&A. Um, one of the uh, comments we received is whether you might be able to uh, repeat the four messages you, the four key takeaway points from the OECD data. And um, so I'm just wondering if in uh, the Q&A, I don't know if you have the ability to do that, but to type an answer um, to that might be the best way to do that. Um, because I think, I think everyone agrees the, the data that OECD is collecting right now is extremely important and interesting. So to the extent you could provide that, um, it would be useful, I think for the discussion going forward as well. Um, Francesco, uh, I wanted to turn to you next and, and, and partly because of what, um, uh, you know, what Oliver be began to mention in terms of the, he mentioned the financial crisis, the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. Um, among other things, your research has focused on that uh, crisis and really the impact of green investments on employment. And um, I'm just curious, given what you've heard from both Enrico and Oliver in terms of the overall level of green investments and um, structural reform, what do you see as the implications this might have for employment and for training and skills development? Yes, thanks for, uh, thanks for the question. And uh, it's, uh, it's really, it was really a very nice introduction from Oliver and Enrico to lead to this. And uh, uh, well, actually uh, what, what, we, uh, what we observe, I mean, as a main implication for, uh, uh, for I mean, creating jobs uh, uh, through the green fiscal stimulus is that, that, uh, we, need, is that we, we need to, to build the skills that are appropriate for uh, uh, the green transition. I mean, that can be differentiated between uh, low carbon skills, uh, skills more uh, for, uh, you know, the circular economy. So there are any, anyway, different environmental problems. Okay, so what we can identify is uh, uh, general green skills. We have not identified green skills specific to different environmental problems. However, what clearly emerged from our research is that what has the effect on the average Commuting zone in the U.S. is estimated in a is very imprecise. It's not estimated precisely. Especially one reason is that the money uh, of the green recovery in the U.S. under Obama uh, w went to communities that were going already well in terms of employment growth. So it's extremely difficult to uh, depurate this effect from pre-existing trends of these communities. However, when we try uh, disentangle to what extent is effect deferred depending on the level of local competencies uh, or local green competencies that we uh, build now in a definition of green job and green skills that has been also widely uh, accepted by accepted or received a lot of interest by uh, also the OECD, the, the world now the World Bank, I will give a talk there and uh, the European Commission uh, and actually it's based on a principle of comparative advantages. I mean, I will not go in detail, but uh, and on the task based model of uh, developed by David Otor and uh, uh, Daron Semoglu uh, uh, at MIT. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, an application of this. So what we found going back to the, to the key point is what we found is that the effect on employment of the green recovery package is much higher in communities that already have the appropriate competencies. Importantly, uh, if we replace as the mediating factor of the effect of green policies uh, something like uh, the wealth of the community or other measure of human capital, we don't find the same effect. So it's really something specific of this, of this type of skills. And actually the related research, not necessarily applied to the green recovery package where we evaluate the effects of other policies like the Cleaner Act in the US or uh, uh, using energy prices in Europe uh, to mimic the effect of uh, carbon, carbon pricing in the future. We always find the same. We always find that there is a shift in the demand from uh, uh, let's say low skill manual workers, but actually this, this effect is not very clear and I will go back on this perhaps later. But especially what we observe is that there is an increase in the demand of technical and engineering skills. So I didn't say this, but it's very important. The skills that we found as green are mostly technical and engineering skills that are acquired both through high education, so an engineering degree, but also to uh, vocational schools and to technical education. Okay, So actually that flag the importance of this type of middle skills where we know, for instance, some countries like Germany are particularly strong. So actually the important point is that these green skills are not the same as I ICT skills. ICT skills are more general skills related to uh, cognitive uh, cognitive skills that are related to you know coding, math, but they are not necessarily the same of green skills. Okay, or social skills are very important for ICT. 
less important for green skills. So going back to the issue raised by Oliver of structural reform, what uh, uh, we can tell from our research, I mean, more quantitative research, uh, is that across the board, we have to reinforce training investment. Clearly, one or 2% is, is very, very, very small. Uh, and this uh, uh, and the particular training that we, we have to uh, promote is uh, uh, technical and vocational training. And actually, I have the experience of my country, Italy, that had very strong technical schools, uh, in, I mean, like now, more 20, 30 years ago, and there has been a, a, a steady decline of the quality of the school that we can also observe uh, using PISA test. Uh, so actually, this is a key point. Obviously, this is extremely important also for uh, inequality because this is the way of allowing people to find uh, a, a new good jobs, well-paid jobs, and so to be reallocated not from coal mining or from the manufacturing metal industry to the uh, low service skill jobs, uh, because these uh, will, uh, of course, even if they find a job in low service skill jobs, uh, this is not the same to have a well paid unionized jobs in the in the in the in the manufacturing industry, but to transit from uh, from uh, uh, let's say uh, high carbon manufacturing to low carbon manufacturing, and uh, and uh, this is very important. Uh, on the last point, so I, I can tell all my points. So green stimulus is more effective when there are green skills. Uh, investment in training should be concentrated in technical skills that allow also to smooth their allocation and give new opportunities to the losers. The third point is that, however, uh, the areas that have such green competencies are usually also the area that are uh, wealthier. I mean, even if wealth is not the mediating factor in our in our empirical analysis, anyway, these areas are wealthier. Okay, so for instance, in Europe now we are developing these ideas with the European data. Uh, we we find that the area that where green productions, I mean, where wind turbines are produced, uh, I mean, uh, when bike, bicycles are produced, uh, batteries are produced, are all areas that are rich area because these these sectors that produce this technology are sectors that are anyway high tech high to medium tech sector okay so actually when you spend the money you have to be aware that uh, perhaps you're not going to create big inequality across workers uh, because a lot of jobs also are low skill jobs so we have also we will have a lot of construction jobs in the green recovery so there, is, there will be good opportunities that you have to retrain of course these people should be retrained but there can be inequality across across regions and that's that's key Thanks, thanks, Francesca. And it's really your last point is very, very interesting. I think we'll come back to that because we'll, you know, I think we'll need to explore a bit of the question around just, uh, because you know, part of what this um, session is really looking at is a just green transition, and the just part is is critical when thinking in terms of reskilling and jobs. Um, but thanks, thanks for giving the analysis, um, and it's really interesting to to try to understand, um, you know, what implications that might mean for the green recovery um, packages we're, we currently see on the table. Um, next, I would like to turn to uh, Julia. Uh, Julia, your work at Breakthrough Energy has been focused principally on promoting, at least my understanding, principally on promoting innovative solutions that will dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm curious, based on um, some of the data uh, that um, Enrico mentioned, um, what, you know, what are you seeing? Are you seeing the level of commitment to innovation in the green recovery efforts that you would say is required to make a material impact on greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Thanks, Julia. Thank you, Ben, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Um, so, so let me just start a little bit by saying, you know, how we've seen the opportunity related to massive stimulus packages that really, you know, are, are a unique opportunity to put the energy, the transportation, the manufacturing sector, and all sectors of the economy more broadly on a more sustainable and net zero path. And I think compared to the previous economic crisis, the costs of some of the leading clean technologies such as wind and solar PV are far lower. And some of the emerging technologies like batteries and hydrogens are, are ready to scale up. But just a reminder, I think, you know, the IEA revealed that over half of the technologies we need to get to net zero are not commercially available. And given the decades it takes for these new technologies to, to scale, we must invest in them now in the hope really of being able to reach climate neutrality. So, you know, as governments are, have been thinking about their and investing in their recovery efforts, we've been really looking about the importance of immediate deployment and, um, and, and sort of massively investing in the technologies that are available today, but also thinking about how to prepare for the future ground to essentially help our economies, um, you know, stay resilient in, in, in the future and essentially 
also thinking about how you can bring down the cost premiums of these new technologies, building the skills, um, as well as um, really thinking about that in just that just transition element of this. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we worked with Capgemini in Europe, focusing on what, what would the impact be of having massive investments in five tech, 55 technology quest areas, and those are more related to electrification, green hydrogen, future grids. And essentially, you know, what we showed was how the usual 25 year innovation cycle for these technology quests can be massively compressed and accelerated to make these technologies more, more competitive. It can bring jobs in this in the magnitude of, of, of 13 million jobs could have been created and essentially helping build already the sectors of the future. So we, we did a similar study in the US with Pricewaterhouse who really shows how research and development and innovation is both a job creator in the short term, but also you know, putting the economies on track to, um, to substantially reduce their emission reductions. Now, we've also done some analysis with partners looking particularly at Europe, and we looked at seven recovery plans in detail, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Poland, Belgium, and Austria, that combined represent 70% of the total share of grants that will be dispersed under the European Recovery and Resilience Facility. And you know, we find that some areas of green innovation and deployment are well covered in those national plans. And in particular, there's a huge emphasis on hydrogen and on EV recharging infrastructure. Um, that said, you know, I think while whilst um, we whilst there are areas of the economy where we're seeing, you know, governments wanting to massively invest, we're also seeing sort of a lack of, of missed opportunities in areas such as where, where governments can play a massive role in terms of public procurement, in terms of carbon contract for differences, or, or essentially mechanisms that help bring these new technologies that often come at a higher premium on par with. Uh, existing technologies. So, you know, we saw notable exceptions like of Germany, um, where they are putting in mechanisms like to, to help cost that, to help cover that premium. Um, we did see, for example, that none of the recovery plans that we analyzed actually use that lever of public procurement. That said, you know, we should also recognize that there has been, you know, there's the stimulus packages, and then we've seen a number of countries also come forward with complementary packages that, that are essentially helping meet some of these decarbonization packages uh, and decarbonization targets. And just an example of France, where I'm also based, you know, we've seen um, just a few weeks ago, the, the, the president announced a France 2030 strategy that essentially complements uh, France's national um, recovery spending. I uh, just, just also another observation. I, I, um, you know, I think what what we're also seeing is that the private sector response is equally important. And whilst massive stimulus spending is important, you know, we also think that there's an importance of being able to, you know, address some of the key risks for why some of the private sector are not ready to invest in these new technologies. And so we've been looking at the types of blended financing instruments that are made available in some of these countries, but that's something is more the exception than the rule. Um, and also, you know, we've been also play, playing um, uh, a role in thinking about what are the types of novel public-private partnerships that can be put together, you know, by combining that, you know, public spending with private sector uh, funding and, and in our part also on the philanthropic side. Sorry, struggling to unmute myself. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Um, really interesting. There's also a question in the chat that I want to come back to you um, in a second on. I want to I want to turn to Gabrielle for a moment, but it's really interesting. I think it may be somewhat related. So, so uh, take a look, Julia, but it's really focused on um, early stage and startups and um, financing. And, and obviously that's that's going to be critical um, when we think in terms of innovation. Um, and so it'd be interesting just given, you know, your current experience, but also your previous experience, because you've been working in this area for quite some time and um, any reflections you have on that question. But I'll come back to you in just, in just a moment. Uh, Gabrielle, I'd like to next turn to you um, and really to round out this first series of questions. I'd be interested to hear, um, given your vantage point and that of your colleagues working in the Global South, what do you see as some of the key priorities in in these countries and lessons from green recovery on the ground. Thank you very much, Ben, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening also from my side. It's a great pleasure to be also on this panel here and to give some perspectives, maybe adding value to the 
interventions from the previous speakers, um, because uh, indeed, uh, I think the perspective in the Global South is similar, but certainly uh, a bit different. Um, we all think that um, the crisis has forced uh, some sort of um, a reconsideration of the relationship between the state, the role of the state, the economy and the society. And it has certainly uh, demonstrated the importance of a well-functioning public sector, public spending, uh, complemented you know, by the issues of transparency and the use of uh, digitalization. Um, and we know also that the global south countries, also due to structural impediments and some of the global economic ties, they only have and have had a limited capability to manage and overcome um, the COVID-19 related health and economic crisis effects. Um, as already mentioned, we know that they are operating in a very tight fiscal space, um, which is aggravated by a debt burden situation. And so coming from uh, several uh, exchanges, dialogues and surveys from different organizations, including my organization with our partner countries. There is a long list of priorities and needs, and I would fully support what Oliver said. It is not that um, the interest in, let's say, green recovery measures or building forward better is, is, uh, is, is less uh, in countries from the global south, from our perspective. It is rather that um, the, the starting point <laughs> is, of course, very different. Um, and so, Along the, along the lines of the top priorities, I would like to maybe pick up four that we think they are really relevant for enabling systemic decision-making processes and the implementation of those stimulus uh, measures and structural reforms. The number one is to actually deliver macroeconomic modeling and, uh, and analysis of economic and financial policy measures with high decarbonization, biodiversity and job creation potential. And, and, and so for a whole of a government, and I would like to emphasize that because what we see currently in the limited cases of such modeling being carried out and being made available to governments, very often they are delivered for one specific ministry. Yeah? And that is usually initially the environment ministry. And we know we need a kind of intersectional multi-stakeholder team approach in order to bring together at least the ministries in charge of finance, environment and planning. Because very often, and that's from the practic practitioner point of view, the situation is that the finance ministries, they usually lack the capacity to actually integrate climate and biodiversity concerns into the policies. And so they cannot really you know, assess the financing needs adequately that we all need. And on the other side, the environment ministries, they, they cannot easily engage in the, in the language of the, finance, uh, of the finance ministries. And so it's very difficult for those two to actually come together and to agree together on, let's say, recovery plans and strategies as we have been seen in the global north. So that's the starting point because of course the capacity, uh, particularly in the finance ministries in <clears throat> some of the smaller developing countries is, is just not uh, uh, there where it should be in order to actually uh, move forward in the sense. The second point I want to make is the issue of uh, green employment. Um, of course, all the countries, uh, in particular countries of uh, the global south, they have seen massive job losses and, and, and a tremendous uh, increase in, uh, in, in poverty related effects. And so the top priority number one is to, to create green employment strategies. And, and these green employment strategies uh, have, have to have an effect that is immediate, but at the same time, there's also that, uh, that need and the understanding to invest in a, a future more resilient labor force. And so the question and dilemma is how we actually move and get there um, by skilling and reskilling um, uh, the, the labor force, just transition to just mention it, and by also providing and strengthening support to the, the, the MSME uh, ecosystem um, that is in most of the developing countries uh, the, the bulk of the uh, em employer uh, force. And so this all has to go hand in hand with the industry. Um, there are some examples, uh, some countries invest in, let's say public works programs in the greenest, uh, green infrastructure sector like this Africa, others go into green public procurement, others in the African, uh, on the African continent go into circular economy principles uh, to create green jobs at the same time also to provide a more sustainable value chain for the future. Um, but 
but for sure, the lesson here is also that we need uh, to engage uh, with the governments in developing a just transition roadmap uh, for all the relevant sectors to be decarbonized, not only for the energy sector. And of course, it needs to be a recognition of the of the needs to reskill and to uh, to develop a very specific uh, uh, labor uh, strategy for for that country. The third point is financing, as I mentioned before. So of course, international support is needed for the developing countries. Um, they really need that support in, in order to finance the transition and structural reforms. We just heard also at the COP uh, from the uh, agreement to support South Africa with just energy transition partnership. Um, I think that's a very uh, interesting setup. We will all see how it unfolds and whether it can become a blueprint, but of course, in addition, at the country level, there is a need to reform the financial markets to incentivize and guide investments into uh, sectors uh, that uh, generate these green benefits and, and there are many ways to go about it, whether it's taxonomies, disclosures, standards, um, but also, of course, the development and scaling of sustainable finance products such as green bonds. The first and last point I want to mention here is, is the broader reform of the fiscal space um, that I think we also uh, already mentioned rapidly. Um, there is, of course, uh, a lot of work now going on in this uh, in this field um, to assess the effectiveness of the public resources uh, on, on the recovery, on the green recovery, on the job creation and on decarbonization. We know that we have to support countries in getting the, the, the prices right, particularly carbon prices carbon pricing as a, as a main catalyzer, catalyzer, and of course, to mobilize domestic resources through the removal of subsidies, particularly fossil fuel subsidies or uh, agriculture subsidies. And, and a few more last points quickly. I mean, from our experiences, what we, what we think we can see as opportunities coming out of the first year and a half of this pandemic is on the ground, that there are a lot of green recovery efforts in uh, countries of the global south from the international cooperation point of view, they are rooted in pre-pandemic efforts and they actually can be scaled up because we have knowledge, we have staff, we have infrastructure in these countries available. Yeah? So there is some opportunity to actually deliver the recovery at speed. Um, an important aspect here is also that those measures usually they can benefit to some extent from some sort of acceptance and engagement. And so the final sort of necessary step is to actually really build functional partnerships and alignments at the country level, but also at the international cooperation level. And it's only then I think um, that we can get this systemic change um, and the, the up upscaling that is necessary. And for us, it means learning from each other, from other support organizations, as well as enabling learning uh, across countries. And I think this is another uh, attempt here to actually share that kind of view. And I I'm happy also to share some information later in the chat box if necessary. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gabrielle. Um, really interesting series of, um, of points um, and, and, and really echoing uh, you know, quite a bit of what's been said as well from some of the other panelists um, in terms of uh, um, structural reform, um, and, and the importance of uh, green employment and retraining, reskilling, and uh, reform of the fiscal space as well. Um, Julia, if, if you if you don't mind, I, I did want to come back to you because we do have this very interesting question um, in the in the Q and A that's been presented. And I would like to encourage others um, to to ask questions as well, and we'll try to take them as as they become available. Um, but the question I, I think you, you might have seen is from Falk, um, really asking. Um, you know, why, why do we see a lack of, or, you know, a perceived lack of funds uh, for small and early risk? And in his case, I think he asked about farming in particular, but I think it's applicable to many different types of projects um, in addition to farming. And so just, just would be interested in your thoughts. And then I'll turn to other uh, panel members in case they have some thoughts on this question as well. Um, sure. I mean, I think uh, I very much agree with that um, statement, you know, in terms of there, there are a few examples of countries that have used their recovery spending to actually support more or dedicate funds to startups and venture funds. We, we have one example, I mean, in, in terms of some of the, the, the countries that we looked at, notably in Italy, where they use, you know, half a, half a billion to, to work on, on, on startups and, and, earth and, um, venture funds, but I think that's a more general sort of statement, which is, you know, there's again, the, this, this appetite to work on 
um, supporting projects uh, that are readily uh, available and to, that, that can be deployed to help the, the, the country recover from the transition, but, but not enough funding going into how do you help and incentivize you know, other venture funds and growth funds to, to come into this space. Um, you know, there are, there are existing examples of how that can be done. In, in Europe, we have the European uh, Investment Fund that has fund-to-fund -fund programs also at the national level, but at least, again, um, perhaps it's not through our analysis, but we haven't seen so much umph going in in terms of financial uh, support going into these fund-to-fund -fund programs. I think uh, working with the OECD uh, to, to try and better track that um, is, 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 will, be, will be very valuable. Great, thanks, Julia. And then that sounds like a potential interesting missing uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge gap, sorry, that uh, we might be able to bring to the last question as well. Um, so interesting, interesting point. Just wanted to check um, if there are other uh, any other colleagues on the panel that would like to respond to this interesting question? Oliver, I know this is something you, you know, Green Economy Coalition has also worked on a bit with many of your partners. Um, any thoughts from your side? Sure, look, um, in our structural paper, when we look at uh, 10 policies, you know, the, the idea of, of, um, of R&D is, uh, is generally that sense of, of expanding entrepreneurship and expanding um, research is, is a really good foundation for transition, it accelerates transition, accelerates understanding, accelerates technology, accelerates. So it, it's one of the top 10 uh, structural things that we've identified, so I completely agree. Look, um, uh, you, while, while you're giving me the floor, Ben, I mean, the big challenge here is, is that the message is quite clear from the analysis of Enrico and ourselves that largely, green recovery is not happening at scale adequately. And um, when, when we know that we all, whatever fiscal space, we're all gonna have big debts from COVID. And, and yet we've just come out of Glasgow and we know that we have to accelerate this transition. So why is it that we are not see, seeing this moment as the opportunity, not just to get our economies going, but also follow through on our commitments that we've agreed it from top. And, and that's the big challenge. And, and it, it, it is, we've had to, through all of our trackers, we have to look quite, quite deeply to find good examples, but there are some good examples. And I think maybe rather than just beat everyone up, we should um, highlight some really exciting things. Like you know, certainly from the Just Transitions, we saw that Portugal spent 360 million on a green retraining schemes, which kind of also starts that skills gap that we were talking about. Or Nigeria, for example, sent 60% of their MSC, MSME survival fund set aside for women entrepreneurs. You know, so really tickling this idea of, of, of just transition and, and, and seeing whether or not we can start to address some of the structural failings of our current economic system. So rather than just with the macro message that nobody's doing enough, let's also focus in on some of those um, really important examples. And I completely agree that R&D is a structural intervention that can both deliver jobs and accelerate transition. Over. Great, thanks. Thanks, Oliver. Um, excellent. Um, I'm not seeing any other colleagues raise their hands on this particular question. So, um, Gabrielle, I don't know if you noticed in the Q&A, there was also a question directed to, um, to you. Um, and basically, picking up the, the idea that you, uh, that you mentioned in terms of the, the challenge, particularly between ministries and, and some of the capacity within some of the, the finance ministries. And the question is, I find it a little bit challenging, but I, I would be interested in your thoughts on it. The question is how this crisis, this, this challenge, this tension can be incorporated into the policies of developing countries. Well, I mean, there are a few examples actually that is already happening. I mean, first of all, I think it, it's also uh, something that we have to integrate. We meaning the international cooperation support agencies. So we have to break our own silos. We also have to adjust our own, um, let's say, approach to capacity development. Yeah, because traditionally we have been working with one particular sector or with one particular, uh, let's say, ministry. Um, and so it also requires some rethinking and also requires some discussions with um, the commissioning 
parties, the, the donors, so to speak. Yeah, um, That's one. Um, I think in some countries, uh, there are now a number of working groups existing um, that have been put together, not only uh, with regards to, let's say, the big uh, topic of uh, just transition and uh, decarbonization, but of course, primarily, um, we, we are engaged in a number of those. We are supporting uh, a number of those processes. Uh, of course, South Africa, uh, Indonesia, there are a few, uh, uh, Costa Rica, there are a few countries where I could think of immediately where those kind of efforts are, are being um, uh, encouraged, same in Latin America, Uruguay and Peru. Um, but I mean, these are different uh, small and, and long-term processes that have to be supported. And that's what I meant by partnerships. So basically, um, governments have to um, sit together to, to to decide jointly on on their vision for uh, for this uh, decarbonization uh, road and that is in, ahead of us, um, and and ideally they are doing that uh, in a participatory approach involving not only sectoral governments but of course the industry and of course academia and research institutions and civil society. So that's a major sort of a reform, and we see it in all countries, including in the north, that we are a bit slow in changing our way we're doing business, we're doing uh, policies, we're making policies. But there are changes. Um, there are, of course, also now connections between established groups like the, the Coalition for the Finance Ministries. There are different sort of uh, participatory approaches that are also across existed, existing uh, mechanisms um, that are, are going to be more important uh, now also with the implementation and the clarity also particular of the rule book also for the from the COP26 in Glasgow. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident as long as um, at least on our side, um, on the international cooperation side, there is a, a very close cooperation and coordination um, that has been, of course, the talk for many, many years. Um, and, and we also walk the talk, but, but I, of course, it can always be improved. And of course, we need also the, um, the guidance and the request from our partner countries and stakeholders, um, including, of course, uh, business. Um, and I think that's where we come together somehow from the different um, um, organizations we are here uh, represented at the panel. Thanks, Gabriel. And um, maybe, um, maybe I'd like to shift back to one of the, now we'll just shift a little bit, but back to one of the issues that was mentioned in the first, uh, first series of questions, which was really around this idea of equity and a just green uh, transition. And Francesco, maybe I, was, maybe I could turn to you on this one. You already highlighted uh, in, your first, um, in your first intervention, the potential implications the green recovery packages might have on jobs. And I was curious, do you see any implications or considerations uh, from an equity perspective? much more complicated than what uh, Norma is uh, picturing in the, uh, I mean, there is, I think on equity, there is a debate that, they, that is highly polarized. So on the one hand, you have the kind of optimists that say, well, the green transition is creating a lot of job. There are the technology already there. Everything will go very well. On the other hand, of course, you have the job killing argument that is used by Donald Trump or whoever that say, oh, you are going to destroy job killing. Uh, well, I, I think that we have to be a, a bit more uh, balanced in the way we try to understand uh, what's going on, because there is one issue. Okay, so let's imagine that uh, now we want to implement uh, uh, green recovery pack packages that help workers displaced in coal mines or in the metal sector to find jobs in uh, wonderful green uh, green jobs in the wine, the, in the wine industry, and so on. So we give to them, you know, uh, severance payment, you know. Uh, Standard employment benefit package plus uh, an excellent retraining program. Okay, that's important because we can spend a lot in retraining, you know, very well in Italy, but we can spend very bad in retraining. So that's that's important. So we, we, we give all, all of this. Then there are people that are displaced by international competition, by automation. So what we do with them? So, uh, well, what's the, the bottom line here? And I think that's, I mean, uh, is a political statement, but it's not only a political statement, we have evidence also from. Uh, our economic analysis, can we solve the problem of climate change without, uh, in general, mitigating impact? I think, honestly, this is the big problem, because we cannot treat workers 
different. We have to treat all the workers displaced in the same way, but there is the fundamental problem that all these workers have, uh, have been hit by negative shocks for 30 years, okay? So the working condition, I mean, in, 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 I'm speaking about OECD countries, I, I, I mean, I, so the working condition of these people uh, worsen, inequality increase, the top 1%, so we, can we sustain this? I, I think, honestly, no, we, I think that uh, uh, the gilet jaune is the, uh, shows exactly this. The gilet jaune shows that the, a, little, a small shock in the spending capacity of these people trigger a very big political response that undermine the political acceptability of, of such policies. So I think that when we go back to structural reform, we have to go back to a model of capitalism that uh, is more kind of social democratic model where we reconcile equity and, uh, and environmental. All right, thanks. Thanks, Francesco. And just uh, just so you know, um, I, I think your volume somehow was a bit muted. We could hear you, but it wasn't as, as quite as clear. So you might want to look at your um, your settings a bit as well. Um, uh, OK, maybe that's yeah. Um, no, but uh, we heard you, but it was just not as uh, as loud as before. But but extremely interesting points. I think you I think you really outlined the key challenge. Um, Enrico, I wanted to turn to you. Obviously, some of your data, I think, uh, from the OECD has some interesting points. Um, to reflect on this as well, and, and just your thoughts. Yes, I would say probably like I will, um, uh, there are two main ways in which you can look at how uh, people will be affected by the transition. Like the first one is uh, to look at them as to people as workers, as we've been discussing so far. And the other one is to look at people as households. Uh, so of course, most people are both household and workers, uh, does the world for them, it's basically the sum of these two impacts. Um, in terms of households, um, if you look at recovery packages, you can see that in several uh, countries, there are, there's a number of uh, subsidies that are, they may be regressive since they tend to be taken up by higher income households. Uh, for instance, we have sub subsidies promoting the installation of rooftop solar panels which are primarily targeted at the homeowners and therefore potentially regressive since low income households are less likely to own a house. Uh, similarly, uh, higher income households are more likely to be able to afford uh, an electric vehicle and therefore benefits more from such subsidies. Um, so, so basically we see this strong focus on subsidies on the other side. Another thing we see is that, uh, as also mentioned by other speakers, is that uh, we see a lack of a clear commitment to increase uh, carbon pricing. Uh, carbon pricing is a key policy tool for the low carbon transition. And you know, the literature is clear that if you recycle correctly tax revenues, this will be enough to address any distributional concern. Uh, but also when you're introducing, you know, talking about carbon pricing, then not all the fuels are the same. Uh, and the implication for you know, a just transition depends on which fuel you start taxing more. So just to give a few examples, since here is on uh, transportation, uh, kerosene for aviation. Uh, this fuel phase a very low tax rate, uh, and richer households are the same, at the same time are the one that tend to fly sub substantially more than poorer households. So this suggests that you know, uh, if, you increase, if you start increasing taxes in these fuels, for on these fuels, then you, know, you might be already uh, doing something which is progressive. And at the same time, there's been a recent uh, survey here in France that suggested this might be actually a quite uh, popular reform with the electorate compared to other ones that were mentioned in the past uh, that led to su substantial strikes in the, in the country. Uh, second, uh, another, another example is uh, diesel and gasoline using road transport. And this speaks a bit to the regional dimension that Francesco was mentioning before. Um, measures that increase the cost of these fuels are likely to affect more uh, people who live in the rural areas since they do not have access to alternative public transportation methods. They cannot you know, take the metro to go to work or bike to work. Uh, so this regional dimension is very important in the transition and needs to be addressed both from the you know, worker perspective but also from the household perspective. Um, on this note, I also would like to add um, something else in, in the, when we talk about distribution of, or implication of policies. Uh, often a debate focus on the on who bears the cost of the policy, but also important to understand who bears 
uh, the benefits of the policies. So let's consider again an example of higher taxes on diesel and gasoline, and the fact that rural residents may be more affected since they depend more on cars for personal mobility. Uh, people living in rural areas are also less likely to see a key short-term benefits of higher taxes on, the, on these fuels, namely air quality. Uh, during the pandemic, this is an example has been mentioned several times in the forum, uh, urban residents have been talking a lot about how you know, air quality in the city has improved, uh, and this was a visible benefit to, to, to citizens, to urban residents, of you know, uh, lower, a lower utilization of cars and fossil fuels in the country. But this won't be, or probably what has not been as visible to people living in rural areas. And this lack of a clear short-term uh, benefits for them should also be taken into account into the political re economy reasoning about this reform. Since we all know the you know, human brains, we are geared towards focusing on what happens in the short term, both in terms of gain and losses, rather than long-term you know, benefits or, or risk. So I think you know, when we discuss about the solution implication, regional dimension is important, but also you need to consider the benefits and the costs and how this distributes across region and across time as well. Great, thanks, thanks, Enrico. Um, so we have a, we have a, uh, a pair of very interesting questions um, in the Q&A, uh, one from George and one from Manuel. And so I wanted to turn um, to uh, uh, Julia, Oliver, and Gabrielle. I think, I think you, you all might have um, some reflections and some insights into both of these questions. Um, the first question from George is really, as, you, as you'll see, it's, it's really focused on, um, you know, given, given developed countries' uh, historical role, um, you know, what, um, you know, what strategy uh, should, they, should uh, developed countries be employing and, and, and what responsibility um, towards ensuring that uh, developing countries also are able to achieve decarbonization and ultimately green transition and growth. And, um, and I think the question from Manuel, it's, it's not exactly the same, but it, it's, it can be aligned and it's very interesting as well. And that's, and that's how do we you know, break from that um, sort of initial uh, temptation and, and um, focus on returns. Um, and I, I, here I, I assume we're talking about economic and financial returns um, before looking at some of the other socioeconomic and environmental needs. Of, um, of countries. And so I thought I would just turn those um, over to you and just um, see if, if we have any first volunteers to take a stab at that. Um, Oliver is smiling. So Oliver, uh, that's a good sign that you're, you're interested. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have a go. But I, I actually wanted to also build on Enrique's points. I, I would like to offer something a little bit radical. We, we don't want to just look at, at, at people as workers or households. I, I think we also need to look at them as partners, um, partners for the transition. And when we look at COP, what, what, we, what we see is, is the real challenge of, of the policy being ambitious enough, but the societal demand is growing, growing, growing. So I would suggest that we think of um, radically as, as, as society being transition partners, and we could even try some really ambitious stuff like participatory budget processes. And I, I really, you know, when, when we talk about Gilets Jaunes, um, it catalyzed the French to kickstart the biggest citizens assembly approach, which really almost, if it had been done in advance, it might have um, persuaded that, uh, that, that flare up. So, you know, really getting that commitment up front about seeing citizens as, as engagement partners. Uh, your two questions are quite specific. I think I'm gonna leave the, George's question to our energy transition expert, and that would be fair. Uh, on the second one, um, look, we, we, as economists, we have a little bit of a temptation to sit there and talk about um, the downside and the costs and the distribution. I, I, I wanna emphasize again and again and again, we have a, a, the most extraordinary economic transition to manage in the next decade. That is um, an upside of, of innovation, of new technologies, new transitions, new jobs. Now, we have an economy um, that serves two thirds of the population of the world reasonably well and is, is already breaching climate limits. Well, let's see if we can reach um, the full population of the planet with, with, with goods and services that, that actually help us both on climate transitions, on lifestyle creation. And that economic upside is far more significant 
um, the the transition downsides and where so the question of of of, re of returns you know, I see unlimited potential for societal development as long as we get our, our solutions that are uh, low carbon and nature positive. Um, and so it is, a, it is a, an idea of redefining what um, our terms of success are and to make sure they are, are codified within our economic system and our governance and our allocation of resources. But the solutions exist where you can have a nature positive energy sector, you can have a nature positive and a climate zero energy sector. And the jobs inherent in that, I put map that across transport, you map that across food, you wrap that across infrastructure, city development. And you're talking about a great renaissance of new economy rather than a, rather than a downside. Over. Great, thanks. Thanks, Oliver. Very interesting, very, very interesting point. Um, Gabrielle or, or Julia? Sure, sure, maybe maybe I can start. Um, I think you know I think it's incredibly important to bring down the costs of the technologies because ultimately you need to make them affordable and ubiquitous products that anyone is going to want to buy. And if you think just the likes of cement or steel or you know your car, it's going to deliver um, the same type of service, but it'll be in in the short term incredibly be more expensive and ultimately also you know some of these these large scale projects are are still perceived as very high risk. Um, so one of the things that we've been working on at Breakthrough Energy has been working actually with the US, with the European Commission and the EIB, with the UK, in trying to blend public, private, and philanthropic funding to actually support and provide blended sort of funding and last mile capital to large scale projects in the area of green hydrogen, in the area of sustainable aviation fuels, in direct air capture, as well as in green hydrogen. And the idea being that those, this targeted program is essentially there to bring down those green premiums of those products and to accelerate the, 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 the learning curve such that they become less risky as well as less expensive. And I think here the idea really is to blend public funding with philanthropic and corporate funding at, that are expecting lesser levels or less higher levels of return and working with the private sector that has you know a lot of the expertise for identifying these technologies identifying the projects and we're also combining with that what we call offtake agreements so some of the corporates that we have brought together are also there to when there's a need and if they're if it's attractive to them to purchase some of those the the of the products that will come out of these factories so all of this being to again, to accelerate the deployment of these technologies and, and to bring down the costs. Another example of what we've been doing is thinking about how do we work indeed with emerging economies. And so we've, um, again, worked uh, mission innovation, you know, so that's 22 countries plus the European Commission in terms of how do we collectively work on making sure that these, these, these projects in emerging economies can be supported and how do we find uh, opportunities related to research and innovation and, um, and, um, and other types of opportunities in, in those economies. Um, so essentially, uh, my sense is, you know, we need to be able, one, what is the largest contribution that, that some of these, um, you know, European and other countries can do is to invest in these technologies in order to bring down the costs. Uh, you know, uh, one model that we find very interesting that, that that we've heard about is actually led by GIZ, which is called H2 Global, and this the idea is that the 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 that the German government is using a billion dollars of subsidies that they have available for green hydrogen in order to ensure price stability of, of hydrogen from projects that are in these emerging economies. Those are the types of, again, de-risking uh, de elements that will be able to support, you know, and bring further investments into these projects in emerging economies. Great, thanks, Julia. And um, uh, Gabrielle, I don't know if you have any reflections. I think some of the questions are highly relevant to, to your work I have, as well. Yeah, I have maybe, maybe three points maybe. Uh, but first also quickly coming back to what Enrico said, because I think it's relevant also for that discussion. Um, 
who bears the cost of the policies and um, and who who profits or who takes uh, who who is earning the benefits, um, and also what Oliver said. I think here what I mentioned when I started off in saying that there's a new uh, a role for economy, uh, uh, state, and um, and society. I think the the situation that we have seen in France and not only in France, also uh, around the world with the Fridays for Future movement, is that we have to. Uh, for all these measures and strategy, whether it's in the global south, now south or north or south, we have to translate um, the, the the policies um, into something that is understandable. Yeah, under this uh, uh, term, leave no one behind, that is often misused and abused. Uh, um, it it really means actually to restart. Uh, let's say a, a, a very simple. Um, Governance related uh, sort of processes, yeah, it really means you know to to make these policies understandable and and understandable means also to get them uh, as Oliver said rightly um, discussed and shared up front and not just at the end and this is a key, very difficult political, very sensitive of course process, but this is I think what we all have to uh, support, whether it's on uh, a reallocation uh, of uh, industries or workers or whatever kind of policies we're talking about. Um, and I think that's the only way we get uh, societal uh, engagement. Otherwise, uh, I think we are not looking very good in the future. Um, and so that is something that requires new concepts and approaches. And we have to find maybe also new support for, for professional skills in uh, with, with data, data analysts, what we what we heard in many developing countries now that they do not have, you know, experts who actually can really um, um, analyze uh, um, continuously, regularly existing data in order also to come up with the necessary um, strategic advice to to the governments. The second point I want to mention is is what what we can do from the international side. Of course, there are a lot of discussions ongoing. Um, we just very uh, softly touched on um, the, the issue of uh, negotiation related to debt for climate or nature swaps. There are you know, some of the uh, processes ongoing and continuing. There's also um, ongoing work with other international finance institutions to create new finance vehicles and international frameworks there. I know that uh, Oxford is working on a, on a, on a sustainable finance uh, framework um, that could become a standard and they're trying to pilot it currently in one African country. So there are efforts underway, uh, but of course, these are only pieces of the puzzle. And so the big challenge is actually to get um, um, this dynamic puzzle <laughs> um, um, uh, somehow uh, as a picture. And I think this is something where we still lack probably as, this is my very personal point of view, I think we, we still lack, um, um, uh, the best approaches uh, for the time being, because there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of information, there's maybe even an overflow of information, but how to get, you know, the smart alliances is something um, that that is that is our challenge, I think, in, in the future, in, in, in discussing and exchanging uh, within our own communities, but also, you know, across communities and with countries. Um, I, um, yeah, I think the question are very, very valid. They would uh, merit probably a discussion on, on their own. Um, but yeah, I mean, these two, these two additional elements, elements I want to, I want to add because I think it's, um, it's, it's a very tricky, these are very tricky questions as you rightly said, uh, Benjamin, I mean, yeah. Yeah, thanks Gabriel. Yeah, no, it, absolutely. Um, and um, um, I'm just cognizant of time now. So we're, uh, the, the session is, is, is quickly, uh, quickly running out of time. Um, but I did want to, as I promised at the beginning, I did want to um, circle back around to each of the panelists for a final question. Um, and and this would be to um, to really consider, given what's been said, but you know obviously more broadly, given your current work and uh, you know other um, other interactions you've been engaged in, um, whether you see any key knowledge gaps in areas of future work and research that could either be undertaken by the OECD or other organizations. I, I think, as you may know, you know, part of what the Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum tries to do every year is really bring in some of the, the leading experts and thinkers and to consider you know, what else needs to be done. And that, that helps inform 
um, not only the OECD's uh, work program going forward, but but many other many other organizations as well. And so I, I did want to um, uh, provide an opportunity for each of you to to speak on that point. Um, if there's some key things you think we should be we should be looking at as a broader community, um, perhaps I'll if I if I may, Francesco, uh, is it, if it's okay to start with you. Sure. Thanks. Um, I have also actually advertised also a bit my work. I have a uh, OECD working paper uh, that is a, a broad overview on the distributional issue and how uh, the impact of uh, green policies in general affect both uh, emission, distribution, equity and efficiency will be out very soon. And uh, I tackled some of this point in this paper. What uh, I think is extremely important uh, is to focus on the political acceptability. So, uh, and to focus on the political acceptability, there are two dimensions that from this uh, review and also from this discussion emerge as extremely important. On the one hand, we have to better inform people. So we have, uh, for instance, and also Enrico mentioned this, uh, if we reduce pollution, uh, the poor people are going to benefit in terms of health, okay? Because the, very often poor people are living near extremely polluting sites. Okay, so, but the, the problem is that these people are preferring to live in this polluting site and work in this polluting site uh, rather than reducing pollution. So in a way, there is a problem of, there is a, there is a trade-off. So they improve their health, but they, they may worsen in the short term the economic condition. So what, what's the point here? The point is that try to understand distributional effect along several dimensions and improve the information on the distributional effect on the dimensions that uh, are regressive, like uh, the, perhaps the job effect on low skilled worker, but progressive on the side of the, uh, of, of, of the health effect. And related to this, try to understand to what extent improving information is enough on policies, is enough uh, to overcome all the uh, like uh, hidden regressivity sometimes, especially of green subsidies, as Enrico mentioned, uh, that uh, characterize green policy. So actually, can just informing people and discussing more broadly with the society, of course, is extremely important, be enough to overcome the resistance uh, against green policies, especially of the, uh, let's say, poorer and less, less, uh, less wealthy part of the population. Can this be, be enough? Or again, we need a, a broader redistribution. I think that's... Great, thanks. Thanks, Francesco. Very interesting uh, questions. Um, Gabrielle, uh, over to you, your thoughts. Yeah, just one additional point, I fully concur. Uh, I think uh, it would be very relevant to, to dig in deeper into the definition of, of green jobs, um, green jobs and green skills, um, um, because it is, uh, it is often used as the argument, and yet we know that there is a lack of understanding what exactly it is, despite, of course, the working definition from ILO and, and, uh, and the continuous work here. Um, I think in international acceptable standard would be very helpful, at least guiding countries in revising um, or revisiting their uh, educational qualification and, and labor plans and strategies. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Gabrielle. Very, very interesting point. Um, Enrico, uh, from your side, uh, you've, you've obviously been collecting a lot of data and analyzing it. Do you see other um, major um, data gaps and questions that we should be looking at? Um, I thought I would have been dispensed by this question yeah, from the OECD, but uh, if I uh, should react to some of the other comments, I would say um, probably like also building on what um, Oliver has mentioned before, talking about positive things. We see uh, that several other countries are, many countries are working on uh, just transition on their employment. These are done at national level, state level, regional uh, or regional level. Uh, so what I think is that there is definitely uh, a need or an opportunity to start learning from each other. We see there are a lot of studies that look at the past uh, industrial structure experience, like you know what happened in the rural region in Germany uh, when you close uh, coal mines in the UK and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think like there could be an opportunity to start analyzing already what are the, the first um, evidence from this initial uh, just transition strategies implemented by, uh, by countries. And something else is, of course, uh, maybe data. Uh, there's often like, you know, a lack of data on uh, the distribution of pollution at the more disaggregated scale and how different socioeconomic classes are affected beyond 
in Canada, so like, you know, gender and um, age and, and so on and so forth. Great, thanks, Enrico. Um, Julia, uh, I think you already mentioned a key, a key gap in knowledge and, and, and where we could use some additional research um, earlier in the discussion, but I, I wanted to come back to you and see if, you, um, if there are other ideas you have. I think just building on Enrico and, and Oliver's points around, you know, what are some best practices or what are some good practices and, and how, you know, things, there, there, there might be some more um, examples to be put at the forefront that, that show how, you know, a particular collaboration or partnership or particular blending of, again, public-private partnerships have made a, a massive difference in terms of using the economic recovery as an opportunity to speed speed things up when it comes to decarbonization, when it comes to you know participatory dialogues between different types of, of actors. Um, so I think really around best practices. But I do I do think again that um, you know having been through the exercise with our partners around trying to identify uh, what is the impact of recovery on on innovation and 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 how to sort of better surface through the recovery packages what is related to the green transition, what is related to innovation. I think there's more, much more work that could be done around tracking and assessing impacts. And I think we, we, we're certainly excited to be supporting the OECD to be doing that work moving forward because again, sort of understanding, tracking and, and assessing is, 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 is going to be extremely important as we think through the lessons learned um, coming out of the pandemic um, uh, when we do. Great, thanks, Julia. And that's a, that's a very nice segue um, to Oliver as well, um, given the work you, you do around tracking as well. And, um, and Oliver, I, I, you know, I would be very curious, um, you obviously conducted a lot of analysis and research prior to this session as, the, as part of the background paper. Um, so given what you've heard today, that, that analysis and your experiences, what would you say are some of the key, key issues that we still need to address from a kind of a research, more of a research perspective? Well, we, thank you. We, we need to answer the question why governments are largely not taking this moment. That's, that's one sort of macro question because we've only got a certain, we've all got a certain amount of money. We, we need to accelerate this transition. Why isn't this the moment? Um, from the structural policy work, uh, you know, some really interesting things. One of the smartest things I've seen is, ah, sorry, UK based, um, is, is just the idea that uh, London should be a, a sustainable financial center. Because that's really smart because that works out how much are we exposed to carbon bubbles and carbon prices, but also how are we going to be on the front foot as an investor of choice and, and, and a driver of this. You know, that's a really smart um, sort of piece of policy which kind of fits in our top 10 structural reforms, really get the sustainable finance sector sorted. Um, I think there is a, a, a broader point that um, Manuel in his question and Francesca was touching on which is this idea of multiple benefits. Um, the piece of research that I'd like to see, and it's in our structural uh, policy paper, is, is the idea that you can actually start to create um, social, environmental, and economic returns with the right sort of structural policies. So and OECD is one of the best jobs we've seen. It thinks about GHG and jobs, but also let's not, forget there is a nature crisis and there is a trust crisis and there is a political economy crisis that's emerging. Um, so how are we going to deliver the right sort of interventions that, that maximize nature improvement, GHG reductions, um, inclusion, jobs, uh, gender issues, all of those things. So a, a, new, a new mindset needs to emerge on, on multiple outcomes and we are able to better map the individual policies and their contributions to a broader set of outcomes. And don't just assume getting your economy going again will, will, uh, will reduce your risks. You need to get the right sort of economy going again. And this is the right moment. So I, I would like to see more research on how to connect structural policy interventions to multiple outcomes and that we can be much clearer on, on the benefits that are delivered. And we start on that work in our paper. So thank you. Great, thanks, Oliver. Uh, thank you, thank you so much to to all the panelists. Um, it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. We discussion ranged from uh, from the data on green recovery measures to the implications the uh, recovery programs are having on both employment and equity. 
Uh, we also heard a number of insights related to innovation and innovation policy and ways that we can begin to uh, stimulate more research and development and, um, and had some uh, very concrete examples of how that's being done, how, that, how that's being um, catalyzed. Um, I think there was a very clear uh, message that there is an urgency for action. Um, and relatedly, some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that are presenting themselves in, global, uh, in the global south as well. Um, I think we also had, uh, you know, and, and you think that you just highlighted this um, very well, Oliver, uh, very inter interesting discussion on the need to shift from um, really the, the crisis mode, the, 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 the response we've seen now to much more fundamental structural reforms. And I think we saw this both in terms of the, um, you know, the measures that are taking place now, but also as it relates to innovation. Um, and, and both of these, as they're, you know, really critical to allow us to ultimately achieve a green economy transition. So really far reaching, wide ranging discussion. I, I, I think it was extremely interesting. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're quickly running out of time. So I'd just like to um, use this opportunity to say a sincere thank you to our five panelists, uh, Julia, Francesco, Oliver, Gabrielle, and Enrico uh, for providing us today with your insights. And uh, of course, thanks again to the OECD for organizing this session and the forum. And a final sincere thanks to all of you, uh, the participants from around the world uh, for your active engagement in this discussion. Uh, we had some excellent, uh, sometimes difficult uh, questions um, and it's been a real, it's been my real pleasure and honor to help facilitate uh, today's uh, discussion. Um, and with this, I believe we can go ahead and conclude this session of the forum. And so now it is my great pleasure to hand the virtual podium back to the OECD and uh, Rodolfo Lassi, the director of the OECD Environment Directorate to provide the closing remarks for the forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me say that uh, we are very happy for, for this uh, forum. Uh, we had a lot of participants. Uh, I would like to thank you all um, the speakers and moderators we have shared, uh, um, who have shared their knowledge uh, with us over the past three days uh, of the OECD Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum. We brought together some 38 uh, policy makers and experts, as well as uh, a few hundred participants in the six sessions, both in person and virtually in this hybrid conference. We have discussed uh, how the pandemic has uh, triggered a uh, rethink in greening cities and transport and how recovery plans are contributing towards these goals. And as, as we heard uh, just in this previous session, uh, much more needs to be done to ensure that the large funds mobilized for recovery measures contribute to address climate change and reverse the many worrying uh, environmental trends we observe. Let me now uh, highlight a few of the key takeaways from the past three days. First, uh, it is the decade for climate action. We need to make the commitments made at COP26 a reality and turn them into concrete action. Uh, smarter green recovery spending is central to this ambition. The pandemic has acted as a train accelerator and catalyst for change in city design and urban mobility. But the teleworking revolution and better environmental awareness raise both the challenges and opportunities for cities to remain attractive. Mayors are at the forefront of tackling these challenges, but national urban policies will need to play a role in connecting sectoral approaches, shaping a long-term vision for green, inclusive, and smart cities, and catalyzing uh, funding and investment. This, this, uh, this also applies uh, to building energy efficiency measures. Energy poverty is another aspect that uh, these measures aim to address. Paying attention to affordability of greener uh, housing and mobility is key to ensure that all parts of society participate in the inclusive low carbon transition. Many speakers also said that a better understanding of individual behavior is also an essential condition for this. Regarding the tourism sector, to make tourism more sustainable, local and regional level decisions determine what kind of tourism model they want 
while coordination uh, with national policies, with the participation of businesses, is also important to align uh, their initiatives to SDGs and, and the Paris Agreement targets. Uh, actions needed to happen at individual, cities, regional, and national level. As highlighted by uh, Sharon uh, Dixner, uh, mayor of Utrecht, uh, meeting our climate targets is not a race to be the biggest or smartest. It's about doing it together. Uh, but some key actions need to happen at the international level. Uh, to decarbonize the aviation sector, governments need to act globally. But they should also implement effective policies uh, back home and a regional level, uh, on a regional level, sorry, with like-minded countries. Finally, innovation is central to the decarbonization, uh, to the decarbonization of many sectors, especially for aviation and ship, I should say. And carbon pricing is crucial uh, to driving fast takeoff on green technologies. We will take all these key messages uh, and knowledge gaps identified and we'll aim to reflect them in our future work. I want to share with you that the next GGSD forum uh, theme uh, will be uh, how the green recovery efforts are addressing green innovation and technology. So uh, I will see you uh, next year in 2022. Uh, and we will be very happy, of course, to uh, address all these uh, new uh, relevant topics. Many thanks to all the speakers and participants, the OECD organizing team, as well as the interpreters for your contributions. So thank you, thank you very much. Have a nice evening.